Hello, I'm Dr. Lewis Hoffman, and this video lecture is on Transpersonal Psychology, A Brief History and Introduction, and it's developed for a History and Systems of Psychology course. There's a lot of confusion about what is transpersonal psychology, and there's a number of factors that contribute to why it is so misunderstood. One of it is the diverse individuals that are associated with it, including many individuals that were doing their writing and contributions to psychology well before the formal development of transpersonal psychology, but yet they still are viewed by some as founders of the transpersonal psychology movement. So there is a lot of variations that are seen, and when people look at these different variations of uh, psychologies that get associated with transpersonal psychology, often people are, are confused. When we look specifically at some of the, the major identified figures, well, William James is one of the people that comes to mind often, as well as Carl Jung. Both of these individuals were doing their writing before the formal development of transpersonal psychology. And their ideas, though there were some similarities, were quite different. Abraham Maslow is generally identified as the father of humanistic psychology. However, he's also frequently seen as the father of transpersonal psychology. So here's another place where there's some confusion a little bit, and we'll talk later about the confusion between humanistic and transpersonal psychology. Maslow, in essence, predicted transpersonal psychology and did make some important contributions that are connected with transpersonal psychology, but his home is probably more in humanistic psychology, right? But yet he was a, an important person in really uh, predicting and identifying what was to become transpersonal psychology. Ken Wilbur is a name that's associated frequently with transpersonal psychology, and he, he tends to be a very controversial and sometimes even polarizing figure. There are some people that are very much fans of, William, uh, of Ken Wilbur in uh, transpersonal psychology and others that really have tried to move away from Ken Wilbur. Ken Wilbur himself uh, identified as a humanistic psychologist and later transpersonal psychologist, and then ultimately founded Integral Psychology, which he sees as, as his home more current, currently. That, by many, is seen as a transpersonal psychology, but he was distinguishing it from transpersonal psychology in many ways. So there are um, some right confusions about, there's some confusions about Ken Wilber and his relationship to transpersonal psychology for good reason. Stanislav Grof, Michael Washburn are two other important uh, influential figures, and Stanley Krippner was influential, having studied a wide, wide range of uh, ideas connected with humanistic and transpersonal psychology. And one of the things that has been impressive by about Stan Krippner is that he has been very closely connected with the American Psychological Association, recognized by a number of divisions in the American Psychological Association for his contributions. And so he has, in many ways, helped to give more legitimacy to transpersonal psychology through a lot of his efforts. He's also been a, a very prolific researcher and writer uh, that has really helped to establish some of the credibility of transpersonal psychology. It's important to note that all these names are males, and that was common with so much of the history of psychology and something that is really problematic. It's beginning to change some. But when that bias is there, you know, it is important to recognize it and to consider how that may have influenced transpersonal psychology some over time. So the beginnings. I mentioned that Maslow predicted it. Well, he predicted it September 14, 1967, at a Unitarian church in San Francisco. He predicted a fourth force of psychology that was emerging that would draw upon a lot of the, the what was seen in the political climate and cultural climate of the 1960s. And there were things that were identified as likely being connected to this. The experiential experimenting and uh, teaching and approaches. So looking at a very experiential approach to spirituality, to psychology, to personal growth, this was all part of it. Religious and spiritual uh, explorations were also very much a part of this, as well as explorations of altered states of consciousness, including drug-induced altered states of consciousness. So a lot of these ideas then would become part of transpersonal psychology. So he did 
fairly accurately predict what was going to become transpersonal psychology. There's debate, though, about whether there ever really has uh, attained the status of a force. It has not really impacted the broader field of psychology enough to adequately be called a force in the opinions of many people, and I would agree with this. So while it has been an important approach to psychology, it does have a broad following, it has its own training programs, its own uh, professional organizations, and a lot of adherence to it. At the same time, it has not impacted psychology as a whole enough to necessarily be considered the fourth force in psychology. Now that's beginning to change, I think, some, particularly as transpersonal psychology is often thinking about itself as a spiritual psychology. And as it talks about itself in the context of a spiritual psychology, it has combined a bit more with the psychology of religion and spirituality. And so transpersonal perspectives are being seen more in the last five years in texts on the psychology of religion, texts on the psychology of spirituality and psychology of religion and spirituality, which is often put together. And as it has been able to present itself in this way, it is having more of an influence over time. With Maslow's prediction, some tried to incorporate this model into other contemporary psychological models, contemporary um, the 60s, I should say, there. And this was done successfully in a number of ways, uh, particularly within humanistic psychology and transpersonal psychology and humanistic psychology fit together fairly closely, which makes some intuitive sense, just that, that Maslow was often considered, has often been considered the father of both of these approaches. But others felt that a new modality was me needed beyond what was out there already one that explored the, the higher realms of consciousness and altered states of consciousness, one that considered the transcendent or transpersonal realms. So this was the group that really influenced the development of transpersonal psychology as its own theoretical orientation. Uh, it remains through this day to really be a broad theoretical orientation with many subsets in it and a lot of different variations. But it's also one that's not very well known. I should, should clarify that too, that I've taught history and systems at a number of different uh, graduate programs and undergraduate programs. And typically when I ask the question, how many of you have heard of transpersonal psychology, there may be two or three at most that will say that they've heard of it. And this is out of classes ranging typically from anywhere from 10 to, to 30 people in the course. So that um, lack of familiarity with it, in many of those classes, no one had heard of it. So that lack of familiarity with it really has worked against transpersonal psychology as well. We think of transpersonal psychology and depth psychology. And here I'm referring to depth psychology um, broadly. Sometimes depth psychology is used to refer just to Jungian. But a more broad understanding is it's you know, different approaches to psychology that really value digging into a deeper understanding of oneself and the human experience. Transpersonal psychology certainly fits in that realm. So it shares much with the other depth psychologies, particularly Jungian and humanistic. Those are the two that it aligns with the most closely. The major difference really is that the implicit goal of some type of spiritual attainment, and this I'll come back to throughout the lecture, because this is um, really essential in understanding the the difference of transpersonal psychology and some of the other approaches, particularly humanistic approaches. Now, spirituality here is understood broadly as something beyond the personal or transpersonal. And that's the literal meaning of transpersonal is beyond the personal. So some type of spiritual attainment or beyond the personal attainment is generally very implicit, if not explicit, in transpersonal psychology. And this is something that distinguishes it. So the definition, as I just mentioned, beyond the personal. That's the very succinct definition of it. It's beyond the personal. It's a psychology that looks at um, the, the person in the context of also connecting beyond the personal. So it assumes there is some experience beyond the personal or the boundaries of self. Now, there can be different ways of, of conceptualizing something beyond the self. It can be something beyond the self that 
is connected and incorporated with or dialogued with beyond the self. So we can look at that in different ways. But there is something of value that uh, beyond the self. Now, in some conceptions, too, there's the view that the self is an illusion. This is particularly there in transpersonal approaches that are Buddhist transpersonal psychologies or that have been heavily influenced by Buddhism or other Eastern thoughts. But it would be a mistake, I think, to say that it is only Buddhist approaches of transpersonal psychology that would view the self as an illusion. That can be the case beyond uh, the more explicitly Buddhist approaches as well, even if it comes largely from a Buddhist or Eastern influence to transpersonal psychology. So what we see with this then is that transpersonal psychology assumes a metaphysical reality. But at its best, it avoids metaphysical claims. I'm going to come back to some ideas um, connected to that here in a minute because there have been critiques around this. But it assumes a metaphysical reality, but in the broadest sense of transpersonal, it avoids specific metaphysical claims that would align it with certain spiritual traditions. It's more broadly spiritual, more broadly looking at these and understanding them. So transpersonal examines these transpersonal experiences or altered states of consciousness and believes that they are potentially healthy and beneficial. But again, it avoids those specific metaphysical claims. The experiences in themselves don't necessarily represent change, but they may be a part of change. They may, for some, represent a change as well. But it may be these um, transpersonal experiences that could be altered states of consciousness, peak experiences, a variety of different things, that they have the ability to, to be healthy, beneficial, deep in awareness, and serve, influence a person in moving towards a, a growth, particularly a spiritual growth. So it, it um, explores religious and spiritual experience, or we often talk about that, but avoids being explicitly religious or spiritual in that sense. So some of the, the risks then, when we look at this, some cross the line to making transpersonal religiously integrative, but are not explicit about doing that. Ken Wilber has been criticized for this, that many of his ideas, uh, it will be argued by some, are, are very Buddhist. And I, I certainly sympathize with this uh, approach, though um, would need to dig probably further into deep to Ken Wilber really to um, come to the same conclusion more definitively. But Ken Wilber is often viewed as someone that is um, Buddhist, has developed a Buddhist psychology, but doesn't acknowledge that it's a Buddhist psychology. So this is one of the criticisms of his. I certainly think it would be an error to say that his psychology could be reduced to just being a Buddhist, based on Buddhist ideas. It certainly goes beyond that. So that uh, place, I think the, the criticism does break down, but there are a number of Buddhist ideas that certainly are incorporated, um, are very Buddhist sounding, at the very least, ideas that are, are incorporated. Now, others attempt to integrate transpersonal psychology, transpersonal psychology with religion more explicitly. James Marion and Mark Epstein do this. The risk is not so much in integrating, but in not being explicit about it. Personally, I think it's a problem when religious ideas or values are incorporated without being explicit about that. We need to be honest about that. And that can open up a lot of doors for, for conversation and debate, and easily there could be um, several hours of, of lecture or debate just exploring that topic a little bit more. But to be um, a Buddhist transpersonal psychology or a Hindu transpersonal psychology or a Christian transpersonal psychology, that is okay. Uh, it, it's a, uh, explicit, and uh, particularly when working with the clients about it, but it's important to be explicit about it. When it's incorporating a religious ideal and not being uh, explicit about it, particularly when working with clients and potentially influencing clients, that's where it becomes problematic. Uh, the confusion about transpersonal psychology, I've mentioned some of this back at the beginning with the different people that are associated with it, the many different approaches that are associated with transpersonal psychology. So that's where some of this uh, confusion comes from. But there's some other things that we should acknowledge. One is uh, its connection with sex, drugs, and paranormal experience. 
So transpersonal psychology, when you look at its history of the 60s culture, both transpersonal and humanistic psychology had engaged aspects of popular culture at that time in ways that now are viewed as very problematic. And even within these fields, often viewed as very problematic. And so that, um, that's where some of the uh, confusion around this comes. But psychologies are always going to be influenced to some degree by the culture that's around them, and often to a very large degree by the cultures around them. And this is part of what's happening as these approaches has emerged during the 1960s and 70s. That's when they had their most influence. But to reduce them to some of these early ideas or, or mistakes would be also a mistake. Transpersonal psychology has had an interest in altered states, as I mentioned, and this can include altered states that are drug-induced. There's been a lot of research within transpersonal psychology with psychedelics and other types of altered states of consciousness, and this is something that um, is often viewed now as dangerous. In the ways that it was done back then, certainly there were a lot of limitations and problem, uh, problems with the way is that this was engaged early in its history. What we're seeing now is there is a return to looking at uh, research around psychedelics and um, altered states of consciousness in different ways, but in ways that have learned from some of the errors of the past, the mistakes of the past. Transpersonal psychology also will look at paranormal experience with a, a very open mind. This is one of the things that I really appreciate about Stan Krippner, who's a, a colleague and friend of mine uh, that I mentioned before, has been very influential in transpersonal psychology. He's someone that embraces this openness, I think, wonderfully. I don't know that I've ever met someone in the field of psychology that embodies it as well as, as what Stanley Krippner does. This openness to different experiences. And with this openness, it can uh, be an openness to explore things that often are considered just abnormal, uh, maybe even abnormal in a way that's psychologically diagnosable. So, for example, transpersonal psychology has often looked at the experience of alien abduction. But notice the importance of that word experience in that, the experience of it. Not saying that it happened or didn't happen. And in general, that's going to be the stance of a lot of the people that have taken a research perspective investigating this. There are people that um, report the experience or feeling like they've been abducted by aliens that do not appear in our um, broader consideration to fit with the diagnoses of having a psychotic experience. So how do we understand this? Well, it's easy to just assume, well, if there's that type of belief, there must be some type of pathology there. What transpersonal psychology has done instead is trying to non-judgmentally, from a more objective perspective, examine these individual subjective experience without the baggage that is often associated with um, the field of psychology as far as its uh, judgments and prescriptions and assumptions about what is normal and not normal. That openness to be able to explore these uh, experiences that are anomalous experiences is very important and that's one of the really important transpersonal books, actually, is Varieties of Anomalous Experience. Stan Krippmer, along with some colleagues, edited this book and it was published by the American Psychological Association, which is really an important step for transpersonal psychology to have this book published by the American Psychological Association. And in this, you can really see that, that openness to look at these different uh, topics that in a lot of psychology we have um, judgments towards these different experiences and transpersonal psychology has remained open to a different approach to trying to understand that. Another uh, criticism that comes up that has been addressed with the idea has been addressed with the idea of the pre-trans fallacy. And Ken Wilber wrote a, a very important article on the pre-trans fallacy that was published in the journal Humanistic Psychology, and looking at distinguishing pre-personal experience from transpersonal experience. Pre-personal has more of a regressive aspect to it, um, going back uh, and losing one sense of self, one sense of a personal experience, whereas transpersonal 
is transcending, going beyond. So that's a different process that is talked about there. And this distinction is very important for many in transpersonal psychology. It also can be argued to have some important, um, to be an important consideration when thinking about diagnosis and differential diagnosis as well. Relationship between humanistic and transpersonal psychology is another area of confusion. Because again, transpersonal psychology to a large degree emerged out of humanistic psychology. Many people that identify as transpersonal feel comfortable with it being a branch of humanistic psychology while others really see it as something different. And there's been a lot of uh, confusion about this even to the political levels that have occurred over time. Humanistic psychology, the, the particularly the Society for Humanistic Psychology, which is Division 32 of the American Psychological Association, sponsored transpersonal psychologists when they tried to create their own division. In a, the APA process, there was a requirement for there to be another division to sponsor a new division coming forward. And so the Society for Humanistic Psychology did this with transpersonal psychology. After two attempts, it failed. and It was not approved. And so the Society for Humanistic Psychology created an interest group in transpersonal psychology. This was done to create a place for transpersonal psychology within the American Psychological Association. So it was intended to be something advocating for and supporting transpersonal psychology uh, and its place within American psychology. However, that also created a bit of a barrier for transpersonal psychology to try and continue its pursuit for, as becoming its own division. And so some have been within transpersonal psychology that want to see it more distinct, have had some negative feelings towards humanistic psychology, perceiving it as creating a barrier from transpersonal psychology, establishing itself more independently. Now, in my view, as someone that identifies primarily as an existential humanistic and humanistic psychologist, is that the that humanistic psychology has consistently really tried to create that space for transpersonal psychology to be an ally of transpersonal psychology, not to be a barrier, but also can understand how some of, particularly without an understanding of some of the history and the motivations, how that could be lost and misunderstood as well. So that relationship between humanistic and transpersonal, one, it's um, been an unfortunate misunderstanding that has uh, created some barriers that were unnecessary in my view, but also it has created some misunderstandings about the relationship between these two and more particularly what transpersonal psychology is. When we think of transpersonal psychology and its development, it assumes a growth-oriented perspective towards the transpersonal or towards the spiritual. Different theory, in some conceptions, I don't want to paint this as everyone in transpersonal psychology uh, agreeing with this because it's a rather controversial idea, but in some conceptions in transpersonal psychology, and Ken Wilbur has advocated this as one example, different therapy orientations are appropriate for different levels of development and different goals. But now the implicit here is that transpersonal, well, it's sometimes more explicit actually, is that transpersonal is kind of that highest level. So the, the message here is that it is a, a more advanced therapy or a therapy for people that are further along the path. So transpersonal therapists may function in more behavioral, psychodynamic, humanistic, existential realms with some clients, but the goal is to get to more of a transpersonal area. Again, this is not all transpersonal psychologists, but it is focused on this developmental approach. I'm sorry for the typo there. It should say transpersonal psychology is developmentally focused, or, um, focused on development. So it's focused on, on this type of development with a bias that the spiritual development is the highest realms. Well, this, um, and, and it focused to remove some of the barriers to that growth and facilitate this growth process. I think this does a disservice to transpersonal psychology viewing it in this way. And my sense is that most people that identify with transpersonal psychology would not agree with that. 
but yet because some are familiar with that, there's this hesitancy and this uh, suspicion of transpersonal psychology. I think there's a couple of problems with this. One is it takes a, a bit of a condescending approach towards other approaches to therapy. So that's, that's one problematic aspect of it. Uh, a second problematic aspect of this is that it uh, assumes that a transpersonal psychologist can function from all of these different realms effectively, but some of these take a, a lot of learning to be able to utilize these different approaches. So that, that can be another uh, problem with this. Uh, it also renders itself somewhat inappropriate for clients that are not religious or spiritual and don't have any interest in that area. And it assumes that these people, because they may not have an interest in religion, religion and spirituality, are um, somehow less developed or less focused on their growth that there's something wrong with them, that they're resisting this. So that implicit there is, is problematic. But also it, it suggests that a transpersonal approach is not really appropriate for working with a lot of clients. And I would disagree with this. It can be adapted to working with a very wide range of clients. So there are a number of problems with this aspect that sometimes um, comes up in there to some degree just in stating that there is a, a growth-oriented aspect of people that has a spiritual end creates a certain degree of problems there. It's one of the reasons why, for me personally, I identify a little bit more with that existential and humanistic approach, though I value a lot from transpersonal psychology and, uh, and certainly integrate uh, from that approach as well. When we look at uh, how transpersonal psychology functions, another aspect of it that it can be controversial is its incorporation of religious and spiritual practices as interventions. It can include mindfulness, meditation, contemplative traditions, and, and other spiritual aspects of spiritual interventions. They, there are a lot of complexities to this that are well beyond what we could address here. Uh, just just in mindfulness or meditation alone, let alone all of these other variations. At one transpersonal conference that I went to, there was a very informative dialogue that I think was helpful in considering this. And this dialogue was about if you are someone's therapist, is it approach to often is it appropriate to also be there? A meditation teacher to teach them this process. Is that something that should be done by someone else and maybe the therapist and the, the meditation teacher be in dialogue with a, a release of information to, to um, be able to discuss certain things. For those that felt that um, we needed to have a separate meditation instructor, the concern was that this was incorporating a spiritual intervention in the therapy and creating some confusion about roles. This is something that I think uh, is very important to look at in transpersonal psychology as well as other approaches to psychology that integrate religious and spiritual perspectives into them. That the ethical considerations about this is something that is really vital to consider. And it is being done some in transpersonal psychology and other approaches to integration but is often missed as well with people that seek to integrate these. Mindfulness can be really challenging with this because mindfulness for some is, is uh, very closely associated with Buddhism, but others use this, this idea and don't necessarily connect it with Buddhism. And there's confusion around it in the field of psychology. Personally, I wish we would have um, had done a better job at using different language that when people had developed psychological approaches that now are referred to as mindfulness that were not drawn primarily from Buddhism, that these would have been uh, developed under a different name instead of incorporating a name that can easily be confused with, with Buddhism. Now that's a, a perspective that um, I recognize there's a lot of controversy around, but there, this confusion about whether mindfulness is Buddhist or not in the field of psychology I see is really problematic. It has a lot of potential, 
on both sides. The, the Buddhist approaches to mindfulness and, and the other approaches to mindfulness. They're not something that are completely new. There's a lot of things that have been done in depth psychology that were um, very consistent with mindfulness from well before the mindfulness was being more formally introduction, introduced into psychotherapy in the West. Um, but now it is one of those big crazes and there's some confusion about it that um, I wish as a field we would take some time to go back and work to address and have some deeper dialogues around these. But from the transpersonal perspective, I think the, the really important aspect of this, of this is that we need to give some consideration to the ethical aspects of incorporating religious and spiritual practices in the therapy, um, particularly with diverse clientele. Throughout uh, the course on history and systems, when I teach it, we always look at within these different approaches, epistemology, ontology, and core values. So I want to look at that a little bit uh, here from a transpersonal perspective. Now what you're going to see as you look at epistemology, ontology, and core values, these are largely consistent with humanistic psychology. But there are some variations, particularly around that spiritual aspect that I brought up a number of different times. So when we look at epistemology, it values multiple ways of knowing. That's consistent with humanistic psychology the emphasis on the spiritual ways of knowing. Humanistic psychology tends to be open to those. I, should, I wouldn't say ex, um, across the board at all in humanistic psychology, but many and, and probably most in humanistic psychology are open to spiritual ways of knowing. But within transpersonal psychology, that is more vital. That's more important. Ontology, again, it's holistic, including spirituality, and being more explicit about that, that it must be an aspect of it. Within humanistic psychology, there you're going to see the difference again. Humanistic psychology is very holistic, very open to spiritual, but doesn't necessitate it necessarily. Core values are quite diverse, but you know, as I mentioned, there's a lot of different people that are connected with transpersonal psychology. This looking for some type of spiritual or, or transpersonal growth is pretty consistent, as is the growth orientation in general. So those are very important. Well, what I think is a core value but didn't list here, because I think there are some variations with it, is that, that radical openness to investigating different experiences with uh, a more non-judgmental, non-pathologizing approach. I see that as really being a core aspect of the transpersonal approach in my own uh, biased view of, of transpersonal psychology. It's good for us to also briefly consider the critique and, and some potentials of transpersonal psychology. Michael Daniels is a transpersonal psychologist who really has done a nice job of um, talking about some of the limitations of transpersonal psychology from an insider's perspective. And he talks about this in the idea of transpersonal psychology's shadow. In his critiques, one of his uh, criticisms is the avoidance of the existential realities. Um, that it could include the shadow, or in Rollo May's terms, the demonic, that should be demonic, not demon, is how Rollo May used it. Um, the demonic is very similar to Jung's idea of the shadow. Now, for Daniels, he talks more explicitly about the, the shadow, but I think it's important to bring in the demonic idea that's there in uh, humanistic psychology, is that also can fit with that transpersonal approach. So. so the shadow and the demonic, the avoidance of that, as well as the probably better have the reality of evil right under that because those are closely connected. How we deal with the potential for evil. That's something Daniels think transpersonal psychology has missed on. And he's encouraging for it to be addressed and has introduced some of his own preliminary ideas about this. It can at times avoid un resolved issues or scars in its focus on the, the growth and the um, transpersonal, the peak experiences or transpersonal experiences, and it can ignore the, the personal at times to focus on the transpersonal. So these are some of, of Daniel's critiques. Now some other critiques, and these are based somewhat in my own thinking as well as drawing upon um, engagements with transpersonal psychology. There's a, being in the, the field of humanistic psychology um, a lot of people in transpersonal psychology are very much a part of that, so there's a lot of these dialogues that would go on at times. 
one of these uh, critiques is the cutting off of the processing. That there may be uh, a release to too quickly let go or release from pain. Some, this, one example of this is spiritual bypassing. This is a term that's talked about in transpersonal psychology and some other areas as well that refers to an aspect of this, but I don't know that that's the only um, aspect of it, only way of cutting off processing that, <clears throat> that you'll see. Or others sometimes just using a process of, of letting go and relaxing, meditating, can be used to cut off going into some of the more painful experiences that may need to be processed as part of the therapeutic process. Um, the focus on the metaphysical sometimes can distract from addressing the material and personal. So this is um, another uh, critique that's often there. And when you look at some of these, there's an uh, interesting dialogue in the literature between Kirk Snyder and Ken Wilber that looks at, um, at some of these concerns. That's in the Journal of Humanistic Psychology. So if you're interested in digging a little bit more into it, that's one place I would suggest to go is that dialogue between Kirk Snyder and Ken Wilbur in the Journal of Humanistic Psychology. Um, making the spiritual implicit is biased against those that don't believe in a spiritual reality. So I've mentioned that before. That's a limitation. Also mentioned before the limited ability to work with some clients because of this um, spiritual, this implicit spiritual aspect. <coughs> Now, if transpersonal psychology can own its shadow and can address some of these limitations, it uh, has a lot to offer. It has a lot to offer even if it doesn't do that, but it has a lot more to offer. And I, uh, my sense is that it's going to be more accepted if it can start to address some of these issues. Its engagement with um, Division 36 the, and the psychology of religion and spirituality, I think, is another way that um, transpersonal psychology is really been able to work to expand its potential uh, for making contributions to the broader field of psychology. I'm, I'm very pleased to see transpersonal psychology getting more attention in this organization. And there, uh, I'm sure it's paralleled in some other organizations as well, but that uh, organization as a psychologist is the one that I'm more familiar with. Uh, I'm pleased to see this development there. Um, there are a lot of potentials to deal with the spiritual realms or the um, beyond the personal realms, transpersonal realms, without being relegated to the religious. There's still some work needed here, which I think you can see hopefully through some of the, the lecture at this point. And it offers potential framework for how therapy should change, progress over time for some clients. Again, I offer some for some clients. I, I am very hesitant to put that in the same context of what some transpersonal um, psychologists have, which assumes that getting to that transpersonal aspect is the highest realm or the, the most advanced realm. That again, I think is, is problematic. But it's recognition that different types of interventions and discussions of different types of interventions may be more appropriate at different levels, I think is something that's valuable. It can be seen in, certainly in other approaches too. I, I think if you look at uh, Kirk Snyder's book on existential integrative psychotherapy, you see some nice examples of, of how that can be used progressively, but in a way that doesn't uh, have this implicit bias for certain spiritual or transpersonal types of growth. Okay, so that concludes the, this video lecture on transpersonal psychology. I did want to recommend one other video lecture that is, um, I think, a very valuable one. This is by a colleague, Dan Galen, uh, an introduction to transpersonal psychology. He developed this video uh, to be used in a course that I teach at, uh, at Saybrook University. And uh, I think it's a very nice introduction. Dan is a transpersonal psychologist himself, so you're going to get a little bit of a different perspective. perspective. Um, it's as I noted that while I'm very um, sympathetic with the transpersonal approach and while I, I do um, teach in and uh, coordinate a specialization in a, a doctoral program on existential humanistic and transpersonal psychology, my alignment then is primarily with that existential humanistic approach and humanistic psychology um, with that existential emphasis within it. 
sort of done a lot of work around the transpersonal, but certainly um, have a few different perspectives on them. And what Dan's going to have is someone that aligns more with that transpersonal perspective. So if you look up Introduction to Transpersonal Psychology, Dan Gielen, in YouTube, you'll find this lecture. This is, again, you know, a field of psychology that I think has a lot of potential. It's an important contribution, but is often neglected, which is one of the reasons why I think it's important uh, to give it some considerations in the history and sister in this course to help address some of the misconceptions about it and help recognize some of the, the contributions and possibilities that are inherent in this approach.